We're going to be in the book of Matthew, as we have been. That's been our uh, subject of study over these last few uh, weeks and months. And we're going to be uh, jumping into Matthew chapter 8 this morning. And as we do, you're going to find that as we progress now, as we finish the Sermon on the Mount and left it in, in uh, now moving forward, um, we're going to be grabbing a number of things. And in fact, this morning you'll see that we'll actually be skipping through Matthew a little bit and grabbing some ideas that as Jesus is teaching, speaking, and addressing people's situations that he's touching on. And so I hope that by the end it will come clear. But as we dive in, let's just give thanks to the Lord in prayer and put it all before him and then we'll uh, jump right in. Heavenly Father, thank you again this morning for an opportunity to come before you. Thank you again that you are a living Lord and that we gather in a building and a church is not about the building. These walls simply uh, house a place in which uh, your body has chosen to fellowship, to rejoice, to sing, to gather. But as we gather this morning, we open your word and as we give thanks, uh, we just trust again that it is your living Holy Spirit that teaches us, that's guiding us, that's shaping us, that's molding us, that's making us day by day, moment by moment. And once again, as we often do, I pray that anything not of you would just go in one ear and out the other, but only those things from you would stick to our hearts that would challenge us, that would force us to dig deep, that would force us to uh, do the hard work, Lord, as you challenge us, as you convict us, as you speak to our very hearts. And so I thank you that this is a living word in which the author and perfecter is the one communicating and it's with that confidence alone this morning that we read together and that we worship and look for uh, truth, not any other than your truth, Lord. And so thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping, singing, and praying to you now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in Matthew, and I'm going to read in chapter 8 and verse 18 and following. Again, I'm in the New American Standard Bible. I hope, as always, it's close enough to whatever uh, translation you have in front of you. If you're reading along, it says this. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. Uh, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. That's where we're going to pause for a moment this morning. Because as Jesus begins to address a group of people, once again we see him leaving to the other side and a group having the desire to follow. And yet now when Jesus begins to talk to them about what it actually means to follow him, he declares that the road ahead is not going to be an easy road, but much rather a hard one. It is easy to first communicate the desire to want to follow the Lord. It is another thing to actually walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And as he states there, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. It seems as though we've got a theme about birds, hair, nests, all going on this morning. Not sure what that is, but there it is. The, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I've often said this to you before, and I'll say it again. We love to call ourselves the body of Christ. And yet when we are called to walk as Christ walked, it is a very difficult thing. I'm mindful once again of when we talk about and how often we walk through our symbols and our ceremonies of Christianity. And as we do, like when we share in that uh, covenant of communion together, I remind you how often we take the communion, a celebration of Jesus' selflessness, and yet we can do so so selfishly. How? We take it 
And yet we can walk out these doors after having celebrated the selfless act of Jesus Christ laying down his life for you and I. And we can arrogantly live for ourselves, for our own agenda, for our own way, our own comfort, and our own means. And we're celebrating a man, God incarnate, who came, and when he took that bread and broke it, remember, he went to each disciple and he said, this is my body given for you and for you and for you. And when he came to Judas, he didn't say, not for you. What did he say? And for you. You see, today, we love to say we're the body of Christ, but when it comes to actually following Christ, notice the warning. I, I laugh when I read these things because when we worked and lived in ministry, and for the time, many of you know, as we did in Quebec, uh, our first home together as a married couple, while we stayed temporarily in a small home for a, a few uh, months, the first real home we had was a log cabin with original horse hair and tar shoved in the cracks, single pane windows, and we stayed in this cabin in the woods on a lake uh, well into, uh, I- into the cold season in which the water would freeze. I mean, it was cold. And as we began to be leaders of this ministry, it was a work in progress. And I laugh because when we would have people volunteer often we'd get on the phone with them and we had had it happen in the past where we had volunteered for ministry and what we found was our expectations didn't always meet the reality of what they were if that makes any sense at all we got to places and the accommodations weren't what we thought <laughs> the 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 activities weren't as, as grand as we thought they were in fact i'll never forget this small Bible school in the middle of uh, maple syrup country, Quebec. I was on maintenance originally, and I was under the floor storing bags as the original first group of students was arriving. And I was under the floor listening to this group of students settling into their rooms. I wasn't eavesdropping. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You know what they were doing? Tearing the property to shreds. They, like, they, they obviously had one of our brochures in their hands, and they're like, look at this, lake, lake? They've only got a swamp here. This is horrible. Like, and one by one, they went through, and they were tearing apart like how small it was and everything about it. You know what we began to do? We began to tell everyone not just how awful it was. We took it a step further. And when people would say, hey, can we come and volunteer at the ministry? We'd say, Absolutely. We just want to tell you, the water tastes terrible. (laughs) Uh, It's tight quarters. We live on top of each other. We have nothing. The, The people are hard to work with. Like we went and by the time we were done, we made it, we tried to scare people away. And sometimes we did. But we felt it was better that we did than them come and have a false reality of what they were getting themselves into. Do you know what? Often I have rose-colored glasses when I follow Jesus. Because I think that it's going to be all roses and, and greatness. And we're the body of Christ. It's going to be unity and joy and love and peace and kindness and patience. And then we gather in community and we realize (laughs) that we're all sinners and we're broken and we can be hurtful. And you know what? Jesus, I find so often at a point when you'd think he'd make the message just a little more tolerable, right? Remember the gospel of John when people start leaving him? And his own disciples, he turns to and says, aren't you going to go also? I mean, when, when people start going, here's Jesus. Oh, listen, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot have a part of me. And people are going like, is he want, is he want us to be cannibals now? 
No, there was nothing that Jesus did to make his message more palatable. What he wanted was them to know the reality that when they followed him, it always came at a cost. I've told you before, I'll tell you again, I always want to give God what costs me the least. I give God the excess. When I put money in the offering, it's what's over the top. It's what I don't need. It's on top of what I already have. And yet when God asks me to give, it's not what costs me the least. What God wants is what costs me everything. He wants my life. And now he says, listen, if you follow me, listen, birds have nests, foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And when another asks, Lord, I want to come, but first I must go and bury my father, what does he say? Follow me, but listen, allow the dead to bury their dead. You see, today here's the question. God offers us a fullness, and yet today we can know Christ and yet settle for less than the best for what he has for you. We can settle. And here's the question I hope to leave us with today by the end. What earthly relationship, whose opinion or rejection, what possession, what comfort, what earthly feeling, indulgence, vice, or addiction is standing between me today and the fullness that God has for me. Because today, God gives us an opportunity to step into deeper waters and to enjoy something more than just knowing about Him. It's the power, the rest, and the fullness that comes from abiding in Him. Matthew 19. I told you we're going to skip back and forth. We're going to look at Matthew 19 real quick, and then we're going to jump back to Matthew 10. And then by the end, we'll be right back where we started in Matthew 8. Listen, Matthew 19, verse 16. Someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? He said, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And he said, you shall not commit murder, and you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor what you will have, a treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But the young man heard this statement, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Of God. Again, I remind you that Jesus was not condemning having riches. What he was condemning was when we allow our earthly riches to stand in the way of our heavenly riches. When we come to a place where that becomes our all in all, our source of strength, life, and good. And what we miss in reality is that God is our only true good. But notice what he said, you've done all these things, but if you wish to be complete, if you wish to be complete, and he picks on the one thing, this man had given it all. He had done all the rules. And in today's Christian economy, it's as though you had gone to all the services and attended the Bible studies. And yes, even not the studies, but even just the reading of God's Word. Right, Jonathan? Right. You, you, you've been to the meetings and you, you, you gave to the poor and you did this and you did that and you checked the boxes and you read your devotions. And yet, 
we can miss. We can miss the fullness. We can be so filled with Christian activity that we miss the one who the activities all about. Remember the Gospel of John? You read these words thinking in them that you have life. But it is these that speak of who? Me, said Jesus. They had memorized them, studied them, looked at them, and yet missed the life that was proclaimed in the midst of them all along. And today, there's this invitation for more. And I wonder how often, and I think I've said this before, and I'll say it again unapologetically, I settle for less. Do you know I see this in my earthly relationships, my family, uh, my marriage? There are moments where we know there's something more, and yet season in which we can settle for complacency. We can settle for seasons where there's more there and yet we can settle in our family, sometimes with my family, seasons of disunity. You know what? There's underlying grumblings going on. I'd rather not talk about it. And so we just go with the status quo. Let's just keep going as we're going. At least we're functioning to a degree. How often do you settle? Well, what Jesus declares in this invitation to being complete comes on a hard road. And I'm going to turn to Matthew 10. Listen. Listen to what he says, because he's going to build on what we've already read in Matthew 8. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents, And innocent as doves, Matthew 10, verse 16, now 17. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. What's Jesus saying? Hey, I'm preparing you that as you begin to follow me, the road is not going to get easier, but rather what? Harder. And I want you to be prepared that I am going to allow you to suffer. I'm going to send you to places where you are going to be imprisoned, mistreated. You're going to be taken and you're going to be scourged. You're going to be brought before people. But it is all for what? My name's sake. And notice this, no matter how hard it gets, I will be there and I will be enough. In fact, I will even give you the words to say in the moment that you need them. He goes on and says this in Matthew 10 and verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father is child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, Flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. What is he saying? Hey, listen, just as the Son of Man is not at a place to rest his head, a season is coming in which you too may well experience the same. He goes on and says this in Matthew 10 and verse 37. Listen carefully. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Any who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And you does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. You see, Jesus is speaking of the cost of following Him. 
He who does not take his cross and follow after me. You know what I love how Luke puts it in chapter 9, verse 23? Listen carefully. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow, uh, sorry, take up his cross daily and follow me. Isn't that beautiful? Luke adds that word. He must take up his cross, what? Daily. Have you thought about that today? So often in my life, the Christian life is about a Sunday or a Tuesday Bible study, or it's about a devotion time in the morning or in the evening. It's about a one-time decision that I made at a camp or a rededication that I made at a conference. It's about a moment in time. And yet the more we look at the Lord Jesus, the more we see him say, no, follow me. And as you begin to walk in my way, it's not a one-time event, but a daily decision to what? Die. Pick up your cross and follow me. That every day, listen to how Paul puts it in Galatians 5. Don't turn there for time's sake. But listen, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Do you notice something? Those who belong to Christ have what? Crucified the flesh. That is the daily dying. He goes on to the Corinthians and says, Brethren, the boast I have in you, which I have in Christ our Lord, I die daily. God's been reminding me of this this past week. That every morning I wake, His mercies are new every morning. And today, as I know Him and His righteousness, He gives me an opportunity to die daily to the sin that so easily entangles. And yet so often, I can surrender, become complacent, or fail to walk in the fullness that God has for me. And I can't speak for you. I can only speak for me. I love how Jesus has this profound ability to put his finger on the one thing. To the rich young ruler, hey, sell everything you've got and follow me. And he was down. Remember the woman at the well in the Gospel of John? Hey, go and get your husband. And what did she say? I'm not married. Ah, you're right. (laughs) Because you've been married five times and the man you're with now isn't your husband. I mean, he picked apart their lives and with one word, it's like he peeled open an orange and displayed everything. And what did we find? A man who was ruled by his possessions and yet while looking so good on the outside, he had a master that no one saw on the inside. To the woman, a woman who was so seeking relationship that she was going to earthly relationship after relationship after relationship, looking for wholeness and a quenching of a thirst that she could not quench. And Jesus declares it all and says what? Come to me and I will give you what? Living water. I'll quench what cannot be quenched. I'll fill what in earth's context could never be fulfilled. And here's my question for you this morning. What's the one thing God is putting his finger upon your heart today and saying, follow me? What vice, what addiction, what pleasure, what earthly relationship, whose opinion, whose fear of rejection, is standing between you and the fullness God has for you. And in my life, he's putting his finger on about eight things. So I'm saying he probably is only one for you. 
But today, God speaks. And if you hear His voice, and more often than not, it's when all the other voices have gone away. And I say it's that quietness that when your head hits the pillow and you let everything die down and God speaks, what's He laying across your conscience? Those things where it's time to let it go. Enough is enough. You see, we read through the Scriptures of a group of people, the Israelites, they knew God enough and were willing to trust Him enough to find freedom from the slavery of Egypt. But when it came time to go into a promised land, they didn't know Him enough nor trust Him enough to believe Him enough to go into a land flowing with milk and honey and to enjoy the fullness that God had prepared. Listen, it shouldn't surprise any of us that as long as Israel tries to keep a land that was meant to be received by faith and kept by faith, as long as they try to keep that land, protect that land, and dwell in that land by governing means, military means, and human means, they're going to become more and more odious because it was God's gift to give them and it was God's gift to keep them, but it was their trust in Him that would keep them there. And today we're seeing them try to keep, in man's way, God's things. And the whole world is going to turn against them until they turn to the Lord. It's going to become a testimony of what happens when we try to do God's things in our ways. And the church is just as guilty when we look back at our, her, our Christian heritage and history. We can't point any fingers. And yet there's more. Today, we are called to daily die, crucify the flesh, pick up that cross, and follow Him. What belongs in the grave that's continuing to tag along today? That's overshadowing God's goodness. You see, the people knew God's victory, but they failed to know His rest. And if you want to know the rest of God in Christ Jesus, follow Him. But it will always come at a cost. We came across a beautiful picture in our study in John together this uh, past week, and I was reminded of it this morning when we were talking about allowing God to be our all in all. We read this in John 17 and verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, Jesus says, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. What a great passage. And you know, we looked at this week and I had done something with my pen as we were on Zoom together. But what a great picture. Notice Jesus' prayer. Listen carefully. Here's Jesus. He's a blue book today. He says what in his prayer? May they be one, even as you, Father, are where? In me. Here's the Father in the Son. And yet, what does he say then? Where's Jesus? Here's me. Jesus is where? If the Father is in the Son, the Son is in me. And yet, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be where? Here's me. Where am I? In Him. And I love that picture. Why? Because today when God looks at me, 
It is not the perfection of my activity. No, when I have Christ abiding in me, but now I am found abiding in him, I allow it all to swallow me up. My hopes and dreams are now found not in me, but where? In him. And when God looks at me, what does he see? Himself. Because I've allowed him to consume me. That's dying daily. Lord, consume my life. Consume my hopes. Consume my dreams. Consume my efforts that fall so far short. Lord, today, I don't want just to know about your life. I want you to be my life. For to me, to know Christ is to live, and to die is gain. I want to encourage you this morning that as we go out these doors, there will be every earthly opportunity to settle for less. Relationally, spiritually. And yet Christ will provide every opportunity for more. But the more will always come at a cost. Something has to die. One of my favorite spiritual principles, having become a farmer on Vancouver Island. It takes death to preserve life. Remember that. So important. Even if you're a vegetarian, something will not sustain life if it doesn't first live and then die. And yes, I'm talking to the melon murderers and carrot killers out there. Listen, life is sustained by death. And today, to experience the fullness of Christ's life comes at the cost of death. And I'm being reminded this week of how often I need to die to my own agenda. Die to my good intentions. Die to my poor attempts at being the right kind of dad I need to be or even the right kind of husband. I think I should be. Man, I'm reminded that I can't. Here's the good news. There is one who can. And when I abide in Him and He in me, The impossible is made possible. And today, there is a rest available to you and I that comes in glory when we're willing to give it all up to know God in His fullness. And the sins that so easily entangle that you could not escape are escapable. Why? Because He's provided the way of escape. And the brokenness that seems unmendable can become mended. Why? Because he's the reconciliator of the world. Today I pray that as we go out, we'll allow the Lord to speak. Because to you and I, it each may be very different what God is saying as he said to that rich young ruler. He's preparing us for a hard road. But I'll say this, a very good road. Because at the end, we will not only know about God, we will experience the power of God. Because he's willing to be seen, and even a weak vessel like me. What a privilege. Let's give thanks, and we'll respond with a final song. Lord, thank you that today we can read your word and be challenged. That today... You are a living Lord, and you go out these doors with us. Thank you that you are not confined to a building, a service, or a ceremony, but you go with us, and today you've promised to empower us, to give us the words to say when we need them, the strength to stand when we need to, the strength to submit or surrender when we don't want to, the ability to say no when our body wants to do altar. I mean, man, we are physical, we are spiritual, we are emotional, we are entangled in so many ways, and yet you are Lord of it all. Lord, may we walk out these doors today surrendering ourselves to your Lordship. 
May we be found in you, abiding, tried and true, that you might be seen to a watching world, not just in what we say, but in the lives that we live, that they may be led to your presence. Thank you, Lord, that today you take us to difficult places in which we find you faithful, able, and always enough for what you've called us to. And so we thank you for this community. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives personally and corporately. And we just look forward to seeing how you're going to continue to mold us, shape us, grow us, and make us into your very image as we allow you to work. Thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen.